Well, um, you know, preachers are told to preach the word, and that's what we need to do. We may express our opinions, but we need to make it clear that the hearers know that, in my opinion, that's worth maybe you got three dollars, it might buy you a cup of coffee, I don't know, some places. But um, we preach the word, we speak our opinions, and make it clear that, now in my opinion, but when we preach, preach the word. That's what the scriptures teach. And when we preach the word, we have different opportunities. Sometimes we're preaching the word to those who have never obeyed the gospel. Uh, they need to hear the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. And that is a lot of our preaching is in that regard. Not every sermon, but a lot of sermons are preaching to the lost, preaching the plan of salvation. And then, of course, a lot of our preaching is to the church. Jesus said, you know, teach all nations, baptize them, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So the teaching continues, and really all the letters in practically the New Testament that the Apostle Paul wrote, like to the Ephesians, or to the church at Colossae, or at Corinth, and Rome, these were written to Christians, trying to teach them the proper way of serving God. So that's what we're doing today for this lesson is a lesson to the church. And I hope you understand that needs to be a part of our preaching from time to time. We need to emphasize Jesus and we need to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. But there are times in preaching Jesus that we reach out to Jesus' church. We reach out to the people that are under the umbrella of loving and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Recently I was just reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, trying to do what my mom taught me, to read a chapter from the Bible every day. And I was reading there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, when Paul said to the church at Corinth, now to the church, written to Christians, I beseech you, brethren. Now, I'm reading from the King James Version, and so is our PowerPoint, and we have that word beseech, not a common word today. But it means I beg, I beg. Picture the Apostle Paul begging the church. What is he begging them for? It's a strong admonition. I beseech you. It's strong. What? By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's where I get my authorities from the Lord, he says, to, to say what I'm going to say. And that is that you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by those of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? I thank God that I baptized none of you, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you but Christmas and Gaius. The admonition is there be no divisions among you. There be no divisions. And that's a, that's a challenge that would be of the same mind and the same judgment. How can we do that? Well, there has to be some kind of an authority. There has to be some kind of a reference that we go back to when we have a disagreement. We, we disagree about a matter. You have your opinion, I have mine. We've got to have some ability to go somewhere and, and say, well, here's the rule. Here's the answer. Um, you know, when you have a disagreement in playing sports, there's a rule book that you go by. And when you follow the rule book, you have the answers for them. So it is in regard to these spiritual matters, Paul wanted them to be of the same mind, be of the same judgment, that there be no divisions among them. That's a great challenge and one that we need to heed very much so in the church today as well. Because divisions destroy the body of Christ and hurt the church so much. Uh, it takes the late Brother Ivor North, who preached for the Madison Church of Christ, used to say that it took a hundred years to get over a church fuss. He said all of that generation's got to die out and a new generation come along to get over it. Now, I don't know, that's his opinion, but I agree with the point. It takes a long, long time to get over a church fuss. 
And when brethren get to the point of despising one another, hating one another, the community knows it. And the community laughs. And the community says, well, they can't even get along together here on earth. How are they going to be happy in heaven? Good question. <laughs> That's a pretty good question. And the community knows about it. The community laughs. We're supposed to be, in Matthew 5 and verse 16, the light of the world. A city that's set upon a hill cannot be hid. Neither the men light a candle and put it under a bush and on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all them in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. The community needs to see our good deeds, our unity, that are working together, that we sometimes disagree, but we go to the answer, we go to the rule book, and we follow it to the best of our ability so that we can be of one mind and one spirit and that there be no divisions among us. What are some of the causes of division? Let there be no divisions among you. What are some of the causes? Number one, there's some facet of division that is because of God's difference to us. Jesse was told, uh, Samuel was told that God seeth not as man seeth. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart, 1 Samuel 16 and 7. And Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, that God said to Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, Isaiah. As the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways above your thoughts and your ways. So, so we got a, a little bit of a communication problem here. And that is, uh, we're trying to communicate with the God of this universe. He's communicated to us with His Word. And sometimes there are differences because we're arrogant, we're self-righteous, we, we think we're smarter than we really are, and we, try, we replace what God said with our own desires and opinions, and that's wrong. So that's, that's one area whereby we have confusion and division that we forget that we are man, we are just a mortal man, and God Almighty is the sovereign ruler of this universe. We need to respect what He has said. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 17, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be complete. So it is that uh, the scriptures are God's way of indicating to us his will. A second cause for division are doctrinal issues. Doctrinal issues among ourselves. Different congregations, different bodies of the body of Christ, sometimes there are different opinions. When I was a small boy, my mom and dad went to a lot of gospel meetings, and there was a church in the area that was the fastest growing church in Cookville. And I mean, they were really growing. We, I remember one meeting that I went to and uh, um, they had set chairs out and, and the kids came up and sat on the stage. And uh, uh, I mean, it was just packed to the gill. And so that growing, growing, leaping church. Uh, but there was a preacher came in there that had a more conservative viewpoint of things than congregations did in this area. He believed you could not support uh, orphan homes through the church treasury and, and you could not, um, he was very anti, uh, very ultra conservative and he tore that growing church all to pieces with his legalistic viewpoint. Sometimes that happens, sometimes doctrines come along that cause division and chaos and should not happen but it does on occasion. Listen to Paul in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 28, take heed to yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God which he's purchased with his own blood. I know after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves, men shall arise, speaking perverse things to draw disciples away. Therefore watch and remember by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. The warning was the wolves are coming. The wolves are going to attack the church. Feed the lambs and make sure you protect them as elders of the church that Paul was addressing those thoughts to. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12, 
Paul said, Now if Christ be preached among you that he rose from the dead, how say some among you there's no resurrection of the dead? How say some among you? So you see, in the church, there are sometimes some brethren who say things as if it were of God, and it's not. Paul said, How say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? There is a resurrection of the dead. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. How say some of you? But my point is, somebody's talking when they shouldn't be. Somebody's expressing and it's causing division. They were saying, oh, there's no resurrection. If you can't have a resurrection, Jesus wasn't raised. And our preaching is vain. Our preaching is corrupt, Paul said. So, very important passage. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Jesus Christ to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that would trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel on you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. As I've said before, so I'll say it now again, if any man preach any other gospel on you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Do not listen to the false teachers. Study the scriptures. Go to the word. Find the answer from what God has revealed. But doctrinal issues do create division. Third of all, this is a good one. Getting rid of the preacher can cause a division too. <laughs> uh, some people very think a whole lot of their preacher, and rightfully so, should. Sometimes there comes a need for a preacher to move on, but you know that should be done with great prayer and concern, very much so. People, many people love and care about the preacher and his family, and so. That should be with great love entered into. A preacher friend of mine told me that years ago he was preaching for a large congregation and um, they had only been there a couple of years and they were really growing and had many baptisms and the church was growing. One Sunday afternoon the elders were meeting. He'd been there about two years and they said they'd like for him to call the church building and meet with the elders. His wife said, what are they going to do, fire you? He said, no, they're not going to fire me. They're probably going to give me a raise. And she said, well, good. And so he went over the building. He said, you know, they fired me. So uh, they said their reasoning was, we keep somebody about two years, and then we get somebody else because oh, we've heard everything you've got to say. And, and, and you know, when I first began preaching, that was a sort of a rule of thumb that a lot of congregations had. Two years, that's long enough. It's not long enough. I, Fifteen years is uh, not long enough, you know. Uh, if, you're, if things are going well and good. But the point is, sometimes when elders do think there is a need for a change, some preachers resist it. They fight it. They oppose it. I've known of situations where they've gotten on the phone and they've called members of the church and they've said, you need to get on the elders. They're getting ready. They're getting, they've said, I'm going to have to leave, you know. And they spread untruthful things sometimes, I've noticed some cases, but especially they're not accepting the leadership of the elders and they are fighting opposing. I hope and pray that I can do better than that and not be a cause of division. I haven't so far and I hope not to ever do that and I've told the elders here whenever they need to make changes, I'll be the first one to back them and support them. I'm 73 years young and uh, so uh, just have to do the best we can according to what is God's plan. But the point is, what causes division? We forget that God's ways are above our ways and thoughts. What causes division? Doctrinal issues. What cause can cause division? When the preacher needs to leave or when the preacher does leave, it can cause division if it's not handled correctly. Building projects. You wouldn't think it, but you know that building projects can often cause division. I was working one day on the Sycamore building years ago. We did all the building part except, except for the mason work. And I was down there and putting the black tire on the blocks on the basement wall. And one of the preachers in the area came over to see me. Uh, and he said, well, have y'all had a split in the church here yet? And I said, what are you talking about? We're, we're building on. He said, that's when many congregations split because they're just people that don't want to progress to take place. They're afraid that they're going to have to give more and they don't want to do that and so they are opposed to it. And I said, well, it hadn't happened so far and I pray it doesn't. 
But I've seen through the years that he was correct in some cases. I've known of congregations where the elders have planned to build a new building and a split occurred and some of the ones left and said, well, you'll never be able to pay for it. And they paid for it in record time. So it is that building projects ought to be a positive thing, not a cause of division. Church discipline. First Corinthians chapter 7 says that the church is to withdraw from those who are unwilling to repent of sin in their lives. Talking about Christians now that are doing sinful wrong things and they refuse to repent or change, the elders have a right to discipline them, to withdraw fellowship from them, 1 Corinthians 7 says, after many prayers, after many visits, after a lot of concern and love, you can reach a point where a brother or sister has to be withdrawn from. It must be not done in, with favoritism. It can't be somebody, you know, that you don't like or you, an elder doesn't like and so they're going to withdraw fellowship. No, no, no. That, that causes division, certainly, and is corrupt. But if we're going to discipline according to the scriptures, it needs a unity in the backing of all the members as much as possible by the leadership of the elders. But sometimes just doing what the scriptures teach causes division, such as discipline. Doctor thieves. Personalities cause a lot of division. The good reading that was done a few minutes ago. John said the author of these loves to have the preem preeminence among them. Third John chapters 9 through 11. And that he personally attacked Paul and others in the church was a brother that was of the attitude he's going to run it or rule it. Rule it or ruin it, you know. That was his attitude in the church. And it's the wrong one, of course. The author of these personalities. I'm a Paul. I'm a Peter. I'm a Cephas. There's your problem. In my 50-something years of trying to preach, I think this is the number one cause of division that I've seen in confusion. When somebody tries to dominate and rule either as an elder or as an influential member, and they've got to have their way or the highway, you know. They're going to run it or ruin it or run it or whatever. You know, that kind of attitude, the author thieves, that I'm, you know, I'm the head elder here and everybody else better bow down to me. That brother is certainly a cause of confusion. I remember seeing that even from the days of my youth. My father was an elder in the church and I saw and heard through sometimes the visits that took place that this was a problem often with personalities of people uh, in the wrong area of thinking and causing division. Uh, seventh cause of division is when you have to add elders or deacons to the church. Some brethren are not concerned about the qualifications and some are too concerned. They make laws that God never made. Some people take it personally that, well, I wanted to be an elder. I think I'm qualified to be an elder. And maybe they're not thought to be by the eldership. So it is that adding elders and deacons is a very valuable thing to the church. It can be a cause of division if it's not handled properly. And one other eighth reason for causes of division is just plain old jealousy. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, excuse me, chapter 12, and beginning in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for as the body is one, and hath many members, so are all the members of that one body, being many, are one body in Christ. We have one body, one human body we are. In the church, it's one body, the body of Christ. But we have many different members as we do in our human body. For by one spirit, we're all baptized in the one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free. For the body is not one member, but many members. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? The foot says, I'm not the hand. Yeah, you're still part of the body. You're still a very important part of the body. If um, the ear shall say, verse 16, because I'm not the eye, you know, I'd rather be the eye than the ear. Well, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? No, no, no. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And that, doesn't that draw a picture? There's the eyeball just bouncing around. You can't do that. That's an impossibility. Uh, but there are some people in the church are just about as childish 
You know, they, they're jealous. And especially this is true back in the days of the miraculous gifts. Let's jump over to um, um, verse 25. That there should be no schism, that means division, what we're talking about today, in the body. But that the members should have the same care one for another. Amen. Well, we thought about there being no divisions. And we thought about eight causes of division. In conclusion, let's be peacemakers as much as we possibly can. In Matthew 5 and verse 9, blessed are the children of God, they should be, blessed are the peacemakers, they should be called the children of God. I want to be a peacemaker. Does that mean you're going to compromise on everything that comes along? No, no, no. You don't have to compromise to keep the peace. But we need to be <coughs> peacemakers. We're seeking peace. We want the church to be glorified in our community. We do not want to be known as fighting and fussing and separating, but unified in the cause of Christ. I hope it will never be said of us that we were the cause of division. If there's one here today that's not a Christian, as we said, some of the preaching is to you, not this lesson. But if you believe and you're willing to repent of your sins, Today, you can be baptized. Everything's ready for the remission of sins as the Bible teaches. Or if you are a Christian, you've gone back to the ways of the world and you need to repent, we'd be glad to pray for you. Or if you're going through a great time of crisis in your family or in your personal life and you just, just need some prayers, we'd love to do that as well. Whatever your needs may be, would you come now as we stand and sing? Found unfilled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners blood beneath that blood lose all the guilty stain, lose all the guilty stain, lose all.